So here we are on Cloak Sunday, also Palm Sunday. And I think Audrey made a good reason for this. So I'm going to say a little bit about that. But let me start with a question for each of us, wherever we're sitting or watching. Where do you find yourself this morning? Where do you find yourself this morning? There's obviously many ways one could answer that question. Uh, literally, of course, you might be sitting at home. You might be sitting in the third row. You might be sitting next to someone. Those are all where you are this morning. But you may also find yourself distracted or hot or sleepy or tired or sore. <laughs> States of being. Where do we find ourselves this morning? Could be those things as well. So wherever you find yourself this morning, I want you to consider yourself in this story um, that we've read, and then I'm going to kind of walk us through once again. And the author paints us a very vivid picture. And as we know, there are four kind of tellings of this story in the New Testament. Each brings out different nuances, different angles. And this one that we find in the Gospel of Luke adds some details or some commentary beyond just the narrative that I think will help us see things that are important about Jesus and about ourselves. Now, in the days after this story, um, which we've mentioned a little bit, days that we'll celebrate together this upcoming week, we know there are these hard things coming for Jesus. Weeping, conflict, betrayal, death. But we aren't there yet. We're not in that part of remembering the story, and each part is important. And so, like life, we take each part as it comes. So this morning, we're on this entry into Jerusalem. So let's take a look at this, and I want to see maybe where Jesus meets you and me as we do, wherever we are. So the text, as we've heard, um, Ken read for us, begins on the road to Jerusalem. So you, maybe you've seen some pictures, maybe some of you have been there, but picture yourself on that road, however you think it would look. Picture yourself, put yourself into the story on that road. Is it dusty? Is it crowded? Are there clouds in the sky? Take a moment and look down at your feet. What shoes or sandals or bare feet do you have? And so here we are on this road together. And we've just come from Jericho, the story that comes before the one we read this morning. Because a funny thing happened there. So maybe you remember that, that Jesus called a man down who was watching him from a tree. It was a sycamore fig tree, which I'd like to point parenthetically say, I do know what a sycamore fig tree is with my tree knowledge. And this man that he called down, Zacchaeus, was a wealthy tax collector who said he was going to make right those he had hurt financially. And Jesus called him a son of Abraham. So these are the things that had just happened before. And then Jesus told a story about a whole bunch of servants. And he said that it was good for them and for us to use the things that God has given us. So those are the things that have just happened as we're walking down this road together. I wonder how those things are turning over in our mind those things that just happened, and now we're on this road. And so now, <clears throat> J 
Jesus and his followers on this road to Jerusalem come to Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives. Now these names might not mean a lot to most of us, but they would have been particularly significant to those in this story and to Jesus. Because years before, the prophet Zechariah said that the Messiah, this anointed one that God was going to send to save his people, he would do that from the Mount of Olives. So that is a place of great expectation. And the writer wants us to notice this. So imagine yourself there, knowing that Jesus, this one we've been traveling with, this one that we've been on the road with, this one that we've seen blessing people and teaching, he's come to this place of all places. I wonder what they were wondering at that point. What's going to happen now? We read that Jesus sent two disciples to go ahead and find a colt that had never been ridden. Now, I don't know about you. I probably would have asked, what for? <laughs> I'm that kind of person who, uh, really, I would do most things, but I generally want to know why. That's the kind of person that I am. Or maybe you're the type who would say, you got it. Whatever you say, Jesus, I'm going to do it and go and fetch that colt. Or maybe you turn to the other disciple. Do we hear that correctly? Is that what we're, well, what now? How do you usually react when someone asks you to do something without much explanation? I wonder what they thought. Maybe it's different when Jesus asks than someone else. But have you ever felt like God was asking you to do or say something? I wonder if that's what it felt like for them. Well, they found a cult just like Jesus described and told the owners, just like Jesus described, the Lord needs it. And they gave it to them, just like he said what happened. No explanation, no conversation, or none that's written down anyway for us. What do you think the owners of that cult were thinking? Had they heard about Jesus? Were they followers, maybe like Zacchaeus in the town before, who were willing to give away their things because God asked? Well, we don't know. It doesn't say. And so we wonder. Have you ever felt like God wanted you to give something to someone? I'll bet some of us have. Who do you think is the most like you in the story so far? As you think about those different people, the disciples, the two going to get the cult, these owners, which one of those really grabs you in the story? Where do you find yourself? Now here come some things that I want us to pay attention to because the author is giving some really important details. They're details that maybe help this one look a little bit different than some of the other versions of this story. So first, of course, as we've mentioned, the cloaks. <laughs> they take their cloaks and they put them on this colt and then people start laying their cloaks on the road. We are, of course, used to hearing about olive branches, Palm Sunday. But here we read about cloaks instead. And here is one of these places where Luke or the writer wants us to see something a little different than we might have noticed in the story before. Because while palm branches might mean one thing, and we'll talk about that next year, I suppose, cloaks mean another. Cloaks 
as Audrey said, mean royalty. That's the only time that we would take off our cloaks is before someone who was at the highest stature. And in Israel's history, they had spread cloaks before the king before, coming into the city just like this. So for us as the readers, we're meant to notice this is something that people do when a king comes. This is the image we're presented with here. It is praise. It is offering. It is honoring the one who is above anyone else, yet enters as humbly as we might imagine on a cult. And also in this telling of the story, it's not just the random crowds who are there shouting for Jesus. We often think of, you know, and I've heard this so many times, that there were the crowds that were there when Jesus came, and then there were crowds there when he was crucified, and were they the same crowd or different crowds? But as this writer tells the story, it was the disciples. It wasn't just the random pilgrims who were there for Passover. It was Jesus' followers Maybe those who walked very closely and maybe some who were becoming interested or believers. But this loud crowd of disciples began to praise God because of who Jesus was and what they had seen him do, it says. I wonder what they thought would happen now. They've been at this place where God's chosen one is going to usher in this new era, this new kingdom, of course, I could see you know, everyone getting very excited. We talked about parades and these places where we get really excited about things together. And then I want us to just look at this song, the song that's mentioned here. In other versions of the story, of course, it's the crowds shouting, Hosanna, save us. Rescue us from oppression. But the writer here wants us to notice another thing about the song. Because here we are presented with praise, not please. It's not save us. It is blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118, a song praising God's anointed king. It's an acknowledgement of Jesus as God's anointed king. And then the other half of their song, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven, Psalm 148, which I'm gonna mention a little bit later, describes all of the creation. It's a call to the entire universe to praise the Lord. That's the song that the writer puts in the mouths of the crowd here. It's not just save us. It is we are joining the song of all creation. And so we join this bigger song. We and those who are on the road and in the crowd caught up with the others. Not just us and our song, but all of the creation witnessing God's king coming to issue a new era, a cosmic celebration because he's come from the place that the anointed one will come from. He comes riding a colt, just like the prophet said he would do. Creation itself recognizes this dawning of a new day, just like at his birth. Here we go again. And so we picture the trees and the rocks and the clouds joining into this song. And in that picture, where do you find yourself? Running to the front? Screaming as loud as you can? Standing on the edge, taking it all in? I mean, we're not all parade types, really, are we? Especially around here, I think. <laughs> but we're in it. And what I love is that it says we all have a place in this story. Or perhaps more accurately, places. We all have places in this story. 
We talked a little bit this week in the office about the way we commemorate events from the past, and um, obviously I was thinking about birthdays. It was Audrey's birthday this past week, and when we commemorate someone's birthday, we don't reenact their birth very often, I don't think. But we celebrate the fact that it happened a long time ago with some kind of current celebration. And I say that in that we are not, I mean, while we remember these moments of the story, these, these moments aren't, these moments aren't happening again. Jesus isn't, you know, walking into town, so to speak. But in a way, the story underneath the story continues because the story of Jesus entering into still happens, entering into our lives, entering into situations. And Jesus still calls us to the road, be it metaphorical or literal. I believe Jesus still asks us to go and get this thing or go and talk to that person, just like in this story. And Jesus still gives us the opportunity to pay attention to and join in what he's doing. So where do we find ourselves? At the end of the text uh, that Ken read, there's this one little, one more part uh, where these religious leaders kind of in reply to all of this huge commotion, really, uh, ask Jesus to tell his disciples to stop. Can you get them to stop making a scene? It could stir up trouble with the authorities. No one wants that. These people are being unruly. I mean, there's no decorum. And frankly, what they're saying is just a little bit over the top uh, and potentially blasphemous, depending on what you think, because these people were calling Jesus God's anointed king. And Jesus replies, I can't stop them. This song has to be sung because it's a bigger song than what you're hearing from these people. If these people don't shout, the stones will. And I remember Psalm 148. I would read the whole thing, but shout praises to the Lord. In the highest heavens, all you angels, sun and moon, bright stars, highest heavens, deepest waters, let all things praise the name of the Lord. All creatures on the earth, sea monsters in the sea, every stormy wind, all the mountains and the hills, the trees, every wild and tame animal, every king and ruler, all nations on the earth, every person young and old, Come praise the Lord. All creation, come praise the name of the Lord. That's the song that they were singing. That's the song that we join into. Because we're all in this story. Some of us will march. Some of us will shout. Some will write. Some will cook, some will tell, some will listen, some will lift or carry or fix, some will hug, some will cry, some will go, some will give, some will be rocks or trees or clouds in how we respond all responding in our own ways, but responding nonetheless. Because we must join this song. And I would just say, do what you can. Respond as you're able, but don't not respond. So where do you Find yourself this morning.